Hi, welcome back to Adembrate. Today we're going to be talking about plasma. Now at Adembrate, we're no strangers to plasma. We've made plasma a few times. A few times. Uh, but plasma still holds, you know, just such a fascinating place in, uh, you know, the whole state of matter pantheon. I'm going to call it pantheon. That sounds a lot smoother. Anyways, the point is, as a state of matter, plasma is not very commonly seen in our lives unless we look at the sun, uh, which I would not recommend you to do uh, for a myriad of reasons. Um, but generally, we're most often, you know, faced with solids, liquids, and gases. But plasma is so cool, not just because it's exotic, but also because it's extreme. Plasma, by its nature, can only exist in extreme conditions, or at least conditions that are extreme to a human being. The sun is a mass of incandescent gas, and it is only a plasma because there is so much material there that it's crushing itself down to form a star, and it's blasting out at, you know, millions of degrees. It's amazing. But we don't often come across things that are millions of degrees in our lives because we live on Earth, which is habitable and, as a rule, can't be millions of degrees. However, there are cases when we can produce an environment where plasma can exist. And one of those uh, environments is a near vacuum. So a near vacuum is, you know, it's an environment where there's almost nothing. There is just the tiniest amount of gas and dust. Uh, and that's about as perfect of a vacuum as you're going to be able to reasonably get uh, because perfect vacuums are essentially impossible. But in near vacuums, there is no thing. There's nothing. There's almost nothing. So as a result, anything with energy in it, any energetic particles, can't really go anywhere. And as a consequence, they can't cool down and they also can't transfer their energy. And so the barriers for getting to extremely high temperatures are very low because there's very little material to heat up. So I have a near vacuum uh, tube here. This is, this is a Crooks tube. It was my brother's. Uh, and it's a very interesting little article uh, because there is a little spindly thing inside of it that spins. Uh, and if you get it going fast enough, you notice it won't slow down very quickly because there's almost no air in there to stop it. But another interesting thing about it is that it has two electrodes in it. So, being that there's almost no gas in there at all, right, that's the reason why that thing doesn't slow down, if I were to pass an electric current from one of these little metal plates to the other metal plate, the electric current would essentially just be a beam of mostly free electrons only interacting with the sparse amount of gases in there. And in those sparse amount of gas interactions, the vast amount of the electrons would, would be able to impart a huge amount of energy on those gases, which wouldn't be able to cool down quickly enough. And so, we would be able to produce, seemingly, a lot of plasma. I am going to show you what that plasma looks like. So, what I've got here uh, on the side of it, these two metal things here, these are uh, high wattage, uh, high voltage electrical transformers. So these are going to be the source of my power, and they are going to uh, induce uh, an electrical stream from one plate to the other. And hopefully, that should be very entertaining for you to watch. And also take heed of this little spinny thing in the middle, because that uh, is going to spin in the presence of these electrons, like so. That is at um, a little over half of power on these transformers. And you can see that the spinny thing is indeed doing its job. Uh, and the plasma, or rather the electrons, have excited the few gas molecules inside of that chamber and heated them to a purple plasma, although I think for you it looks a little more blue. Um, and of course, since it's a higher energy, you know, that's a uh, higher wavelength light is why it is purple or blue. And if I increase the amount of power going through there, 
you can see the light uh, is brighter, but not by a huge degree. And this is because almost all the gas particles in there that could be excited already were excited. Now I turn off the current and I turn off the power so there's no more electrons moving through there to keep it spinning. And because there's no air to slow it down or very little air, it just keeps on going for what seems like an unnaturally long amount of time. It's pretty great. In the dark, this effect is even more pronounced. Just let me turn all the lights off. That's low power. And as I increase it, it becomes brighter and brighter. Our spinny boy begins to do his job. And as I bring it up to finally full power here, it's casting light on the objects around it. I'm going to bring it down a little bit lower so I don't pop the breaker. But as you can see, for being nearly airless, that material can make quite a lot of light. Here it is from a distance. This is cool stuff. Another interesting thing to note about uh, this electron-induced plasma uh, is that it being um, produced from electrons, right, there's a, high, there's a lot of electrons in there, uh, it also puts off a lot of beta radiation. Now, for the keen amongst you, you probably already know that, you know, beta radiation is basically just electrons. So, if I actually... Uh, take this Geiger counter, this is Gabe's Geiger counter here, and I, I put it very close to the outside of that vessel there, the Crookes tube, I can actually pick up on the beta radiation uh, that jumps through the glass, because some of it can get out. So we're going to go ahead and see uh, how many counts per minute we can get. So this measures basically how many large spikes of radiation are inside of its little vacuum tube inside of, inside of here. Uh, and right now I have it resting on a granite countertop, so it's uh, a little higher than normal, maybe about twice background, because granite has uh, uranium in it from the mountains. So let's go ahead and let's put the Geiger counter right up. There we go. That's a bit problematic, but hopefully that'll, that'll stand up. So... Yeah. <laughs> There's our radiation count. That's beta radiation, so electrons, basically jumping from the plasma tube in there and uh, ionizing. Every click is, uh, is ionization inside of the vacuum tube in the Geiger counter. Oh man, it's going nuts now. So, if that were, let's say, you know, beta radiation, or not beta radiation, if that were uh, gamma radiation, I would be very dead right now. And when I turn off the current, it stops. So, let's look at what our max count was. Oh, about 983 counts per minute. <laughs> and we didn't even let a whole a full minute pass. So, you know, that's compared to the, the 30 or so you get from twice the background from granite. It's, it's, a, it's sizably radioactive. So... First of all, thanks for watching the video, but I'm just going to go ahead and give a little conclusion, wrap the whole thing up. So, there are a few parts of the video that are a little weird, um, because I just made the whole thing sort of on the fly. Um, first thing that's weird, uh, I refer to it at several times as, ba I refer to the radiation as beta radiation, which, technically speaking, it, it is beta radiation. But there's a bit of a nomenclature issue with that, because a lot of people consider beta, radi beta radiation to only be electrons emitted by the decay of a nucleus, um, whereas others might say, that, oh, that was cathode rays, and it is basically the same thing as cathode rays, they're all electrons, but the Geiger counter only detects beta radiation, so in the perspective of, uh, from the perspective of the Geiger counter, uh, beta radiation was what was being observed, so I'm just going to call it beta radiation. It's electrons, it's the same thing. Um, Another thing of note, um, no, my room, the garage, was not bathed in beta radiation um, because the Geiger counter, if I took it 
even two or three inches away from the from pressing against the glass, radiation just basically dissipated, gone. Because beta radiation can't really exist in the air. It's sort of like alpha particles in that it's extremely easily stopped, but it disperses even more in the air. So you're not, don't be worrying about my safety for radiation because it was not hitting me at the other side of the room at all, uh, for the most part. Uh, and another thing um, is that there were no x-rays coming out, so some people might say, oh, well, there were, you were picking up x-rays on the Geiger counter. Well, that, that Geiger counter doesn't detect x-rays, and I know it's possible that it could, but it's not designed to, and um, it probably wasn't picking up on many x-rays. And another thing was that the voltage on our power supply uh, was almost certainly too low to produce x-rays in any sizable quantity, so I wouldn't suspect that as being the source, since there's just too... Few or too few x-rays to come out of um, electron movement through a vacuum at that low of a voltage. Uh, so that basically wraps it up. It's A crux tube is similar to a cathode ray tube, so don't be smart and put that in the comments. Or maybe do. Maybe start a topic about that. I don't know. Um, it's basically a cathode ray tube, and the electrons move through it uh, and through the vacuum. Some of them interact with gas particles in there, and they ionize them, and during the ionization process, a photon is emitted, and that is what we pick up on as light. And occasionally, some of those electrons also make their way out of the glass, and they come and ionize the uh, tube in the Geiger counter, and that's what we detect in there as beta radiation. So all in all, very fun experiment. Um, Crookes tubes are cool, cathode ray tubes are cool, plasma is awesome. And any time I get to work with plasma, it just makes my day. So. Thanks for watching, and, uh, uh, yeah, bye.